Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Framerate is brought to you by MailRoute.info. MailRoute is a secure hosted service that provides enterprise-grade virus and spam filtering to companies of any size. Try it right now absolutely free at MailRoute.info. On its hands, it had a stinking whale of a problem. What to do with one 45-foot, 8-ton whale dead on arrival? on the beach near Florence. It had been so long since a whale had washed up in Lane County, nobody could remember how to get rid of one. In selecting its battle plan, the highway division decided the carcass couldn't be buried because it might soon be uncovered. It couldn't be cut up and then buried because nobody wanted to cut it up, and it couldn't be burned. So dynamite it was, some 20 cases or a half ton of it. The hope was that the long-dead Pacific gray whale would be almost disintegrated by the blast, and that small pieces still around after the explosion would be taken care of by seagulls and other scavengers. Well, I'm confident that it'll work. The only thing is we're not sure just exactly how much uh, explosives it'll take to disintegrate this thing so the scavengers, seagulls and crabs and whatnot can clean it up. The dynamite was buried primarily on the leeward side of the big mammal, so as most of the remains would be blown toward the sea. About 75 bystanders, most of them residents who had first found the whale to be an object of curiosity before they tired of its smell, were moved back a quarter of a mile away. Our camera stopped rolling immediately after the blast. The humor of the entire situation suddenly gave way to a run for survival as huge chunks of whale blubber fell everywhere. A parked car over a quarter of a mile from the blast site was the target of one large chunk. The passenger compartment literally smashed. Fortunately, no human was hit as badly as the car. However, everyone on the scene was covered with small particles of dead whale. As darkness began to set in, the highway crews were back on the beach burying the remains including a large piece of the carcass which never left the blast site. It might be concluded that should a whale ever wash ashore in Lane County again, those in charge will not only remember what to do, they'll certainly remember what not to do. It's exploding frame rate! Welcome to Frame Rate. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Brian Brushwood. And may I just say that classic. this is the home of the original fail whale. That right there was the original fail whale. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it never, 40 years later, <laughs> never gets old. It was it was a viral VHS hit before it was a viral video hit and, and got new life again on the internet. Let me tell you, one of my all-time favorite shows, and you're from Austin, Texas, so I'm sure you actually caught it. I lived it, but there for on six years. Cable Access, on Cable Access in Austin, they had a show called The Show With No Name. Charlie Sotelo has since gone on to be one of the biggest figures in all of South by Southwest. He arranges a whole bunch of the events, but, but he had a show called The Show With No Name. Man, before there was the internet, you had to work hard. You had to use the internet Usenet groups to find other people to trade videotapes with. Remember Captain Video? Like Did you ever use Captain Video? Wait, what? what's Captain Video? Is that a website? Uh, like late 90s, Captain Video ran the premier videotape trading service. It was BitTorrent before BitTorrent. He had a list up on his site of every television show that he had available that he would duplicate and send to you. And all the price of admission was you would have a television show that you had that you would duplicate and send to him, preferably one that was not in his collection. That's amazing. Do you realize, like, this is how early it was. I went to one of the live tapings of the show with no name, and one of the nice things about cable access television is you could pretty much play whatever you want as long as it was non-commercial, as long as there was no ads 
They didn't really seem to care about what copyright situation there was. And that's where I first saw the full pilot for Heat Vision and Jack with Jack Black directed by Ben Stiller, had the voice of Owen Wilson as the talking motorcycle. And I was blown away and I went online looking for Heat Vision and Jack. And again, this is the days of dial up. I had to find some other guy who had a copy of Heat Vision and Jack but was looking for something to trade. Yeah. So I had to trade him a bootleg of all the HBO Tenacious D shorts in order to get Heat Vision and Jack, which I still have down in my, even though I don't even have a VCR anymore, I still have a VHS copy of a bootleg of Heat Vision and Jack. Captain Video had 10 Speed and Brown Shoe available. Episodes of 10 Speed and Brown Shoe, the when not hit series involving Ben Vereen and Jeff Goldblum. Not Ben, was it Ben Vereen? Now I'm, now I'm, I'm having an Alzheimer's moment, but uh, he had episodes of those. You still cannot get episodes of those on the internet, even on BitTorrent. See? <laughs> Actually, there I think you can get places. a few on BitTorrent. But but frankly, that has been my test ever since. Is like the whole thing will have caught up with itself when I can go on to an online service and on demand watch an episode of 10 Speed and Brown Shoe. Now, wait a minute. So it's 10 Speed and Brown Shoe and there's a white guy and a black guy. Which one is named Brown Shoe? Just answer me that. Uh I believe that 10 speed is uh, Ben because he, he's a, he rides around on his 10 speed and Jeff Goldblum is brown shoe because he's he's kind of stiff and uptight. OK. All right. Well, at least it's not racist. But I noticed that it's created by Stephen J. Cannell. Holy crap. My whole childhood, every awesome show ended with the uh, Stephen J. Cannell on a typewriter throwing a page. over. Oh, yeah. Show. Right. Like, that was synonymous with awesome. Can you imagine for a whole generation, Stephen J. Cannell's name was synonymous with awesome? That is amazing. We had a Zenith television in the living room. The living room, oddly enough, was the room we were not allowed to live in. No one ever went in there. The family room was where the TV was that everybody watched. The Zenith television, with the color was off. It was just, you know, it was kind of there because we didn't know where else to put it. There were a few things that I was always kind of just... Uh, what is that? I want to say um, not ejected, not ashamed of. Uh, well, yes, but um, exiled. I was exiled into the living room to watch. Uh, they were St. Louis Blues hockey games because my dad didn't like hockey. Uh, Scarecrow and Mrs. King. I, I have no idea why. And 10 speed. You ever watch Scarecrow and Mrs. King, King on the on the second TV? Yeah. There what must you, have been like Falcon Crest on at the same time or something my mom wanted to watch. That's all I can figure. Do you, know, do you want to know something weird? Like for our generation, because I remember we like I had a black and white television in my room. And if I, you know, if I was kicked out of the living room, I could go watch my black and white TV in my room. But like, what's that going to be like for my daughter where her secondary experience is that I don't if I don't want to watch it, she doesn't get to sit in my office and watch it with me. She has to watch it in the living room like that's messed up. Yeah, that's a, it's it, it's it, actually you've got so many screens now. It's like, well, which screen are we going to watch it on together? On the yes. iPad, on the computer, on the television. You know, I, I run into that with Eileen sometimes. It's like, we, you know, let's watch X. Well, where do you want to watch it? You know, and the, it, growing up, that would be a weird, that would be a fathomless question. What do you mean where? We watch it on the television. Yeah. In the television room, the, the family room yeah, or whatever it is. on the nice love seat. Yeah. You know, your feet out on the You don't watch it anywhere else. Unless you, yeah, unless you're exiled to the living room to watch it on the old color bad Zenith. But now it's like, well, we could just watch it on the iPad. We could watch it in the bedroom TV. We could watch it on the living room TV. We could watch it in the office so we can get some other stuff done if it's that type of show. It's a you know box also, and Hulu and all this stuff. I find it rather charming to watch shows on the iPad with somebody you care about where it's it's intimate. It's the two of you snuggled up together. Yeah. I mean, even though it's less comfortable. Some candles, it's kind of a little bit precious. of wine. Yeah, yeah. Or or uh, when we drove out to uh, to Florida for Halloween Horror Nights, uh, I remember uh, I remember not watching but listening to The Wire as Bonnie would pull it out on the iPad, and I was able to follow along as we were driving along. You ever have you ever watched any shows what, when you're not supposed to, like while you're driving? I no, I'm because I'm I'm a real stick in the mud. I don't even answer the telephone. When I'm driving, you know this because I've yeah. I've answered and been like, yeah, I, I'm sorry, it took me so long to answer. I pulled over to the side of the road. Like, I, and yeah, I, I definitely don't watch videos. That's true. That's, uh, so, uh, some people in the chat room are pointing out you can buy Ten Speed and Brown Shoe on uh, uh, on, on DVD, which is a recent innovation within the past couple of years. 
but you can still cannot get it on demand on the internet. Yes. Just have to, I, I had, there were all these corrections coming, like, well, you can get it. You can get it on DVD now. But everything else was on DVD 10 years ago. Well, hey, you want to, you want to talk about the big story? Let's um, talk about the big story. Is, it, is this, okay, cool story. This just in, the big story. <laughs> what? Okay, this was especially, uh, I comment on it every week. This time it was doubly delicious because this time, I swear to God, look at me, Tom. This is like, you want to talk about the big story? You're like, yes, let's talk about the big story. <laughs> <laughs> and we're live. And it's time for the big story. Uh, big story this week, Hollywood Reporter has an article that everyone is talking about called What Hollywood Execs Privately Say About Netflix. I I read, uh, you sent this to me, and unfortunately I was only able to glimpse it on my iPhone. I read the first page or so, and then I scrolled down through eight more pages and realized, oh, I should like read this whole thing before frame rate, which is coming up in 20 hours. And then, uh, and then I traveled for 20 hours. Right. Now, but, let's be so, clear. Brian has not slept in 17 days. Uh, pretty much, pretty much. And, and for anyone who follows my exploits at uh, Twitter, uh, at Schwood, S-H-W-O-O-D, we did three days in a row of, of scam school shoots. On one of the days, I ran off to do the PC Gamer podcast. Then Sunday, I ran and I did a, a Twit and also East Meets West, which OMG Chad still talks about how much fun he had doing that. Then it's because the I announced him. It's because I'm introduced him first. Yes, at 4 a.m., uh, I hopped on a plane on my birthday yesterday and flew out to Omaha, Nebraska, because Wayne State College is different from Wayne State University, as I discovered. And I did, performed a show last night at Wayne State University or Wayne State College, because they're not the same. And then this morning, I had to get up at 3 a.m. and drive two hours to Omaha to make it there for a 6 a.m. flight. And I got home, no lie, three hours ago. And you know what I did instead of, uh, instead of going to sleep? Uh, what, what did you do? Well, I watched the Cape, and then I went to sleep. But You're we'll talk nuts. about that in a bit. So, the, and the that's the is, big story. That's no. The <laughs> point is, the point is, is I really got started on this article, and I was super fascinated on it because it's it's a rare glimpse into reality with TV folks. And I don't know about you, but I genuinely perceive that the internet with new media they tend to be better with talking straight with people, whereas TV is still stuck in this whole 1980s format of we have the company line and that's the way it always was and that's the way it always will be, that kind of thing. Uh, and so tell me, what, what did we find out about uh, the way execs talk about Netflix? Well, the summary here is that uh, they are frightened to death of Netflix because of the amazing advance of subscription growth. Uh, it's gone from being uh, Reed Hastings' frustration over late fees in 2002 to becoming 16.9 million subscribers in 2010. I mean, there's a there's a chart in this article that, that shows it off perfectly. It's just crazy numbers of growth, and it doesn't look like it's slowing down. It looks like it's speeding up. So 16.9 yes. million, that is more subscribers than Dish Network has. Netflix is now an what they call an MSO, right? It, it, what they what they call the cable networks, uh, and it, and they they are at that level. Except nobody knows what to do with them, and, and I, th I think the the big reason they don't is that they're like, well, they're like a cable network. So Time Warner is coming out all all like a bear. They're like, we we don't like anything about Netflix. Netflix is going to have to pay up. They've been they've been riding along on this cheap stars deal they struck a couple of years ago. And they want our HBO shows and we're not going to give it to them. He's actually openly hostile uh, and even said about licensing HBO shows that Netflix's monthly rate would have to go up to $20 a month for them to be able to afford it. Basically okay. saying not at no price would we license our HBO shows to Netflix. But before, before I let you react to this, key thing to remember here is Netflix isn't after currently airing stuff. They're not like Hulu. They want to go after library stuff. And HBO won't even let them have the library stuff. They want to let them have Sopranos. There was one quote that I did run across in there that said that, H, that Netflix is not looking for 
There you go. Um, hold on. I'm going to see if I can scroll down and find it. It looks like it's not in this particular article highlighted like it was on the iPhone. But basically, uh, they said they said Netflix is not going to have what aired last night. They're going to have right. what aired a year ago or two years ago. But I, I think it's a it's it, that's fine. Let Hulu be the place that I can fill in my spotty TV watching with what I missed last night or last week. Let Netflix be the place where I discover whole complete archives of stuff. And uh, HBO is crazy. They're clinically insane for not getting on board on this stuff. There's so much. For example, take something that's not making HBO a single dime. The entire back catalog of Mr. Show. Nobody's watching it. Nobody's downloading it. Nobody's buying DVDs for that. It, meanwhile, is the comedy, the sketch comedy that defined my generation and it's so precious and so important to me, and I want so bad to watch all of it. Uh, if it's not on, if it's not on Netflix, it's a crime. Now I assume it, it probably is on on like the DVDs, but not on the streaming, right? Yeah, I think you can get it on DVD, and 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 so here's here's where you get the 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 rhetoric, right? And this starts to seem very familiar when we're talking about an old media industry meeting the internet challenge. Well. We don't want to undervalue our product. We <sighs> we we get this much money from syndication. Not that many people watching video online yet. So we've got to continue. We don't want to undercut the situation with our syndication, with our DVD sales. We've got a lot of money there. And so that's Time Warner is the one leading that charge, saying they Netflix wants to undercut us. They they want us to give them pennies for things that are worth dollars. They you know, and we've got these these great uh, subscri these great deals that we do with the with the windowing. And why would we undercut that? Why would we not sell to, to syndicated local television stations? Why would we not sell to the movie channels? You know, Netflix can't just ride in here and say we're the internet and we just have to make them a deal. And it's really being framed by Time Warner as these guys are the bad guys. These guys are the ones who, who are trying to throw their weight around when they don't have any weight, and it's, it comes across very snobby. I think that the industry as a whole, I mean, forget Time Warner's, you know, they're a cable company, right? So they're going to be the most likely to be upset about Netflix, which of has enough subscribers as a cable company. But there's also an industry feeling that we don't like these new guys. We don't like the Internet. Internet came in in the 90s and started pushing us around, and AOL bought Time Warner, and look what happened, and it was all a sham, and nothing has proved to be the way it was supposed to be when they promised us what they were going to do in the 90s, and so we're going to just drag our heels on it, and I think that's a big mistake. It's totally understandable, but I think it's a big mistake, especially when you consider Netflix, which actually has a person assigned to Hollywood to go around and say, look, I understand your business model. I understand the syndication deals you have. I know your business, and let me strike a deal with you that properly values your content for the Internet. And as and Netflix even says in this article, I think it's Ted Sarandos who says, as we get more subscribers, we can pay more money for content. It's not that we don't want to pay. We just, you know, the, the fact that they're saying, well, we get more money from this and nobody's watching Internet video yet is why Netflix won't pay a lot yet for it. They're going to pay more as they get more viewers. So I had a fascinating experience at uh, the Digital Experience in CES. You were off doing live coverage. I was off busy trying to score a fake badge to get into the event. But one of the booths there was, were the people at Stars, And I think HBO is right when they say that, that Netflix, a lot of their success has to do with the sweetheart deal they have with, with Stars. Uh, but specifically, when I talked to the guys at Stars, I sung the praises of what they're doing with the Netflix live streaming, how all the best stuff is is the Stars content. And he asked me, uh, you know, and I was I was complaining. I was like, well, why can't we have this? Why can't we have that? And he said, well, what would you do in our position? And I said, well, first of all, I'd charge twice as much because this service is way better than cable, and I'm looking for an excuse to get rid of cable. And he said, that, 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 that's what Netflix should do. What should we do? We're Stars. We're the company that secures the on-demand content that eventually shows up on Netflix. And I realized that Stars is in a very difficult situation because obviously Netflix has its own set of priorities. Among them, I assume, is keep their prices low, keep uh, keep expanding their uh, you know their on-demand content. But meanwhile, Stars are the people who bring all the very best content. And ultimately, all I could think of to tell the guys at Stars is number one. 
uh, uh, make it more clear to everyone at home that they're watching stars content, not Netflix on demand content. That uh, and and they already kind of do that. There's the little stars at the very beginning of each of, of each of those. But it's like I think they could be very clear, saying you know this you know is brought to you by stars. We have all the awesome stuff, and since you don't have the stars channel, you're experiencing it through Netflix for the moment. But Netflix may change their mind from time to time, or or deals may change from time to time, or whatever. Uh, and then also, definitely, I think Stars needs to look at other partners because how quickly right now everybody perceive everybody I talk to perceives that Netflix Stars on demand content is tops in the legal ways to watch awesome stuff uh, when it comes to TV and movies, and then you have Hulu and Hulu Plus, which is a great way to you know fill in the gaps. How quickly would all that flip flop if Stars worked a deal and jumped over to Hulu? instead of Netflix. Would that be a game changer or not? Well, yeah, it absolutely would be. And Stars is one of the reasons that Netflix streaming has become so popular and also one of the frustrations because instead of getting their content direct from a distributor or a producer, they're getting it from Stars. Except in cases like Breaking Bad where Stars is the producer or distributor, but you know, the the other stuff is like we're taking advantage of a way to sneak into the window. It's brilliant for Netflix and it's brilliant for Stars. Because when they signed up in 2008, they spent. They only had to. They 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 basically got 30 million dollars for nothing. Wow! It's just 30 million dollars for them to say, "Yeah, go ahead and stream it on your little piddly thing, whatever." Now Netflix is not the little piddly thing. I mean, they yes. they weren't terribly small in 2008, but now it's suddenly become a whole different ball game. Uh, and they're looking at it, going, "No, wait a minute. Netflix's subscriber base is 25 million. That seems about." 10 cents a sub that we're getting from Netflix's subscribers. Whereas if we go to a cable company, we get $4 a sub, a subscriber, wow. in other oh. words. So there's a big difference here. Uh, and I think what's going to happen is Stars is going to get a whole lot more money. Uh, maybe there's, there's some estimates saying predicting Stars will get $300 million. So 10 times as much as they got. So, but still, so that would only be a dollar a subscriber versus the $4, and I think that's fine. I think that's right, because even though Netflix has a number of subscribers, it's still a young industry, and they, they've got to figure out how, ways how to keep that money coming in and grow that money before they can really start getting the $4 that a monopoly that gives you almost no choice can charge you $60 a month for the service that Netflix is charging you $8 a month for. Well, and I, I do want to give proper credit to Netflix as an entity in the, in, in the whole, because... Back in the late 90s when Netflix started, essentially all they did was mail you DVDs. That's it. That was their whole business models was mailing you DVDs and having you mail it back. But you know what? They didn't call it DVDs by mail. They called it Netflix because yeah. they were thinking way down the line that the Internet is going to change the way that we relate to our content and the way that we consume it. And at first I thought it was just lip service with the on-demand stuff. But the on-demand, the instant streaming is getting so, so good and so rich and detailed, I'm discovering, uh, I, I'm continuously pleased and surprised by the, if you liked blank, then you ought to watch blank so, uh, suggestions, you know, bizarre movies. Like we, we were talking a little bit ago about um, really weird 80s sci-fi flicks and, and, you know, certainly Time Bandits popping in there. Movies that I would never be bothered to go find the DVD or even my VHS copy of and stick in, but it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll, you, you get a double click or online, it's a single click and then and it's open and it's on. So it's like, I, I don't mean to in any way take away from what Netflix is doing and what I want it to do, but I think I speak on behalf of all people using Netflix where we just want more and we want everything and we'd like you to, to get it done immediately if that's not too much trouble yeah exactly i mean and that, that's what the that's what the cable companies are afraid of that's what the channels are afraid of the producers and distributors though they love netflix and that is why this is so frightening to somebody like time warner uh disney executive speaking on anonymity says what's not to like they're another buyer even for stuff that others don't consider terribly valuable uh you know they buy rights to old TV shows that a television station would never buy because a television station's like, I need 26 episodes for this to make make it worthwhile. Any show that only ran 13 episodes, Netflix like, yeah, we'll give you money for that, no problem. We'll put it in that library. Uh, and Mark Cuban, I think, actually said it best. He said, Netflix is absolutely a friend to producers and distributors. They are found money 
that is monetizing library assets as DVD sales fall. Well, and keep in mind, Mark Cuban built a whole network on buying crap that nobody else wanted, right? Did, it wasn't his HD net, like where he would just grab, he got episodes of, of Knight Rider from the 80s because yeah. they were shot on film and was able to upscale them to HD content. And all of a sudden, hey, it's all HD, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he HDNet, you know, you can argue how successful it is, but it was one of the first HD channels mm -hmm. in the United States to provide continuous original programming. It wasn't the Discovery Theater where they're just showing, you know, sh nature shots that were made in the 90s. I mean, right. he was showing Knight Rider. He was showing Smallville. He had a whole channel for movies. Yeah, they may have been old movies, but they were movies nonetheless. And it I think Netflix is going to force the issue by going to the distributors directly and making deals, and they're going to be one of the forces that dismantles what a lot of people in the audience may not understand happens, which is that windowing thing that goes on right now. Movie hits the theaters. As soon as it leaves the theaters, it goes into the windows, and the windows are things like, well, it's going to be played uh, on your on-demand system, your pay-per-view systems in hotels and airplanes, and then it goes into your direct TV on-demand where you pay $3. Then it goes from there... And it goes to the premium channels, and it goes to your HBOs and your Showtimes. And then from there, it goes to the broadcast nets, and it's allowed to be on the broadcast nets. And then from there, it goes to the cable nets, and it's got shown with cable. Then it goes back to the less premium, uh, like your HBO 2s, you know, and your Cinemaxes, and it shows there. And then it's like, and once somebody has it in one of those windows, nobody else can have it. That's got to go away. So You've got to be able to have multiple services with the same movie. Let me ask TV you show. this. Is there anything that anybody, I'm, I'm going to pretend you and me are the entire universe. And and who knows, maybe the chat room could be the third voice in who here. Who knows, maybe we but are. Maybe we are, as far as I know, man. You want to get all Descartes on this, man? I'm just <laughs> a brain in a bat now that I think about it. Is there anything good about the old channel delivery of content? Is there any, like, as a child, I have fond memories of, flipping the channel and catching the last half of Roger Moore in, you know, in some, uh, you know, in Octopussy or whatever. Although, yeah, no, he was an Octopussy, right. Uh, on James Bond movies or whatever. But is there anything about that experience that's so good that we shouldn't just scrap all that bandwidth, all that wasted space for channels and have it all become Netflix.com slash HBO, Netflix.com slash Slash SHO. Well, you know, and I mean, maybe I, it should just be HBO.com. You know, maybe the smartest thing for HBO to do it because they're such a good production house is like, yeah, we are the only ones who have our content and you pay us extra to get it. That may be exactly the right thing you, for HBO the, to do. Then you know what? Maybe that's the way, that's the back end that we get a la carte, which is what we've all wanted forever. We all hate that we're paying $120 a month for our cable bill and buying a bunch of channels that we never watch and could care less about. Maybe that's the back end is where you can scrap cable. And granted, HBO is more expensive if you get it as a channel on Netflix. Because I, I think, $20, I think you know? there is something. In fact, I think this is even farther down the road. Like once the windowing system has been obliterated, and those of you in the chat room who disagree, I respectfully disagree with you, it will be blown away. Whether it's sooner or later, it will be gone. The pressures of the consumer society are there for it to be gone. It's an artificial distinction. Uh, but once it's gone, we're going to want program channels again. We're going right. to want that experience of turning on we a website, maybe Definitely in this case, curation. and just see what's streaming. And and Roku has some channels like that where you you pop in and it just has stuff going on. Twit does that. We have twit.tv live streaming, so you can just pop in and see what's on, or you can get things on demand. I mean, people are going to want to have some of that serendipity, but this... This is a very common thing in the internet. It's it's happening in newspapers. It's happening in books. It's happened in music, which is we had these businesses and these businesses as advantages built around a system that had certain things you couldn't get past. So, for instance, with movies, the only way to get it was to have somebody ship you the film. And right. otherwise, it was almost impossible to get the film. And so we're going to build a business where we say, we'll let the planes have the film and no one else. And then the planes get to say they have an exclusive. But then once that's done, we'll take those and we'll give them to somebody else. Saves on production costs because we get the tape back. We can reuse it, whatever, right? Uh, right. Those, those built-in issues that they worked around are now gone. And what all of these industries understandably try to do is say, let's force that back in the Internet. Let's, let's, let's make those things happen just, on the Internet. 
especially as a one-size-fits-all solution. It just makes no sense. Now, I do understand, for example, Renegade Mike in the chat room says, uh, channels hand, hand feed you content. Otherwise, it's too overwhelming to choose from everything on the web. Of course, we want curation, and there's no reason that you can't deliver that. I mean, especially if anyone could deliver that, Netflix, with their built-in infrastructure, could very easily go into the live streaming business and you can have curation but instead of instead of uh wasting set giant chunks of bandwidth all being broadcast from one satellite at the exact same time why not have it why not have a thousand channels where you no longer follow an a company but you follow a person welcome to brian's favorite 80s sci-fi movies and they're all curated they're all built in I, there's a, a playlist where all i have to do is record introductions of why these are my favorite movies and then they go on to play on the stream and only the people watching it are sucking that bandwidth there's a million ways better than what we have now what we have now is inherently wasteful it inherently treats everyone like an idiot and it inherently gives people less of what they want most and i don't see the benefit of it the faster we could ditch everything and go become brains on the internet the happier i'll be and, and it's going to happen because netflix and companies like it once more of them are are starting every day they just aren't very popular yet but they are going to the distributors they're going to the source and they're saying, you know what? Let's build a good relationship. We'll take some of the stuff that's less valuable. We'll pay you for it. We'll give you money for it. And we're going to take some of the stuff that is valuable, but we're going to try to pay you as what we think it's worth. And then when we when we get a subscriber growth and we redo our deal, if Netflix is doing it right, we'll pay you more. Until the point that these businesses become big enough that they can say, you know what we really want to do? We, we just want to buy it direct. You, yes. you make that series. You make that lost. You make that next uh, CSI. And we're just going to put it directly on Netflix. And all of a sudden, that windowing model is done. It's over. The well, only windowing you'll have is you will still have theaters. I think you will always have theaters because people want to have that communal experience of going and, you and know watching what? on a big screen. But once it's out of the theater, even, even in some cases while it's in the theater, it will also be available on streaming. And these other ways will go away. And I think you're right. We free up all that bandwidth because the television stations that do continue, and some of them will will all migrate to internet delivery. All right, two things. First of all, uh, you mentioned theaters. I think it's a two-way street. I think the moment we get uh, curated, instant, on-demand, watch what you want, when you want, you know, curated by who you want, that's going to go the other way as well because there are theaters right now that already have curated movie streams. The, the Alamo Draft House right here in Austin shows really old, long-forgotten movies that are set up by people who care about them. You know, Quentin Tarantino will host a film festival. The uh, Harry Knowles will do his butt numathon or whatever. That's going to get more democratized, and people, uh, people, we're going to follow people and their taste in movies rather than oh, this is what we're being spoon fed this time. The other thing is in the chat room, people are complaining, saying, "Oh, well, you just can't create the same quality for nine dollars a month that you can for a hundred dollars a month." Let me let me make this very clear. You still get my hundred dollars a month. Time Warner is getting $120 a month out of me, and that's fine. Let's just spend it on what I want, not on a ton of crap that I could care less about. There's no reason for us to be wasting all this bandwidth on crap I don't care about. I think you will see, and again, all these people saying Netflix doesn't have money for this. They don't right now, but you're, you're, you're thinking that the world is going to stay in stasis. Netflix will not be $8 unlimited streaming forever. The price will go up. And there will probably be specialty offers for them where you're like, you know what? You buy this, you get access to most everything. But if you want our special original channel, you pay a little extra. Or if you want HBO, because we finally, they broke down and did a deal with it. You pay a little extra, right? And, and right. that will happen too, whether it happens on Netflix or somebody else. But this is the way it's going. And, and, and I, everyone who says you're dreaming, that's not going to happen. This isn't going to work. They're the ones who are not waking up to the reality that you're competing in a marketplace where you can't force the artificial distinction because everyone can get everything online. You're fighting piracy and you're to, fighting uh, immediacy and you're fighting an infinitely copyable universe. And if you don't wrap your head around that, if you stop saying, well, people need to stop pirating. Sure, they do. Or if you say that, you know, well, you know, people need to stop being so greedy and want things immediately. Yeah, maybe they do, but they won't. Yes. And that's the reality of it. you got to swallow that. To quote somebody from the chat room, uh, they said, just remember, if you don't give me what I want, there's a torrent of other ways I can find it. There are. There are. And no, I, somebody, I knew this was going to happen as soon as I said Netflix will have various tiers. It's not a tiered internet. 
for Netflix to sell you different packages. That's no, that's it, not theory. It'll be theory. quality of packages. It'll yeah. be quality of content. You can get you can get all of your you know you can get all the episodes of Auto Man on Netflix at any time, right? Right. You uh, but but then you might have to pay a little bit more to get all the episodes of Seinfeld, and you'll certainly have to pay more to get all the episodes of Battlestar Galactica. You know, it's like or, I can or see. Or even I, be I'm like, okay with yeah, I, and the fact is, Netflix is a tiered DVD distribution already. You pay more yeah. to get more discs delivered to you. But, and but when, they first, when they first introduced streaming, there was an hours limit. And it may be like that. Because when they first introduced streaming, if you had the two DVD program, you got two hours of streaming a month. Then they got if rid of it and smart. made it. They realized, you know what? It's too early in the game for that. We got to get rid of that and just get everybody using it. But I can see that coming in again. It's like, hey, you know what? You pay $8 a month, you get eight hours of streaming a month. You pay $16 I a month, you get 20 hours of streaming a month. Uh, I almost hope they don't do that because it, it's unfair to uh, the quality. Like, realistically, they have to make arrangements for all of this different content, and different people charge them different amounts. And I don't like any kind of solution that has all the content valued at the same. I honestly wouldn't mind if they had a bronze, gold, and platinum level edition where it was like these were the hardest deals for us to secure. These you must you must pay more if you want movies that were in the theater three months ago. Then if you want to search the archives for It's a Wonderful Life, I'm I'm okay with that. I'm okay with paying different tiers for different levels of content. And that's why we actually need more Netflix competitors uh, like a Hulu or, or others to rise and say like, hey, Netflix is going to do it by hours. We're going to do it the way Brian wants it, where it's you know it's 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 parceled out differently there's going to be all kinds of models but i i am 99 percent convinced that you will pay less per month for your television experience than you pay now and you will get more out of it within 10 or 15 years absolutely i mean look at what a more efficient model it is it has to be that way it can't not be that way it's, it's a violation of everything that makes sense about uh, uh the laws of, of virtual you know content physics to, to not have that be the case. All right. Uh, we should thank MailRoute.info for sponsoring Framerate. Uh, if you would like to not have spam, you can sign up for MailRoute. Uh, you just edit your MX record, and then all your mail gets routed through MailRoute servers, and they strip out the spam. They have, Brian, they've taken away 99% of the mail sent to acedetect at subbrilliant.com. I, I, that's not possible. Everyone 99. Knows, everyone knows that spam is the future, and in the future... All of society will break down because nobody can actually get a letter to each other. And finally, Kevin Costner will become the postman. It was written in Hollywood a decade ago. I don't understand why we're still talking about this. Because mail route filters Kevin Costner out of your life. Well, I, I don't it's, know about that. You're but, they, saying, but they filter spam out of your life. So you're saying if you care about stopping Kevin Costner <laughs> from ruining the, our ability to, 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 to send email, you have to go to MailRoute.info. In some sort of metaphorical way, that's exactly what I'm saying. All right. MailRoute.info, it's $2 per stuff. user per month. Uh, for 10 users, if you're a small business or if you're an individual user, it's $30 per year special discount. Try it out absolutely free at MailRoute.info. Stop Kevin Costner. <laughs> It'll make Eileen it turns out very Kevin's happy. Kevin's a fan of the show. Our next letter comes from Kevin. who's like, I really hey, liked you guys. It was kind of uncool what you did. I used to really like that. Remember, I was in Field of Dreams. All right. Well, we don't we don't have a lot of time, so let's uh, let's get to the film film. It's time for film film. Which always Dateline, makes me want to talk like this. Dateline 2011, Phil Bomb takes the stage. Good luck, boys. Hey, good news. Are you excited about the Hobbit movie? I cannot decide. As the pieces come together, I get more excited about it. Let me tell you something weird. I've read and loved The Hobbit as a book, and I got like two-thirds of the way through the first book in The Lord of the Rings, and it was Tom Bombadil bored me to tears, and I gave up. Then I ended up loving the movies. Because they cut out Tom Bombadil. Yeah, because they were great. And they, they, they clicked, and it was that same world that I loved, uh, but it just wasn't slow and making me fall asleep. But I don't, for some reason, I'm, I'm protective of my precious, my, my hobbit. What about you? Precious. I'm very excited. Uh, and I get more excited all the time because I loved, I actually loved the books. I even liked Tom Bombadil because that's where they got their swords. Strider didn't give them to him on Weathertop. Come on. But anyway... Uh, I really love the movies, and 
the fact that The Hobbit was left out was always kind of a sticking point for me because they, they paid homage to it. You see the stone trolls, right? And he talks about his journey and he's riding The Hobbit. And so it's like, oh, I really wish this was part. It would be the whole set. It would be all collected. Uh, and so I'm excited for this. And I'm more and more excited as Peter Jackson is going to be involved with it. There was some, some worry about that for a while. And they are naming uh, people as part of this that were from the Lord of the Rings. So an inside source has unveiled what's supposed to be a production timeline. Uh, filming will run for 10 months from August 22nd, 2011 to April 2012. Post-production from May to November 2012 in time for a December 2012 release. At least that's what they're talking about right now. Main location filming will run from mid-September to January 2012. Uh, wait a minute. How are they going to... Oh, yeah. to January 2012. Mid-September 2011 to January 2012. Uh, half of the filming that, in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Interior okay. and set shoots in UK. So I've kind of missed that they're not going to be doing it in New Zealand, but that's kind of weird. Well, not that we care. I mean, let's face it. The only reason we like New Zealand is because we saw what parts of it we saw in the trilogy. Nobody ever, as far as I know, nobody's ever lived in New Zealand, Tom. Everyone knows it's a fictitious place on the other side oh, of the Oh, no, you're, you're thinking of Chicago. Uh, that, I'm sorry. No, now that I think about it, that is what I'm thinking of. Yeah. But I apologize to all my friends in Chicago. Andy uh, Circus is on board to play Gollum. Ian McKellen is on board to play Gandalf. And Watson from Sherlock will be playing uh, The Hobbit as well as, uh, I, now I'm forgetting his name, but the guy who played The Hobbit in The Lord of the Rings will be on board for uh, an appearance as the older uh, Bilbo Baggins. Oh, and that's cool. And Elijah Wood will be in as Frodo. Yeah, now what, uh, so, so what, Elijah Wood's going to show up for like uh, 30 seconds or something? I mean, yeah, he was hardly anything. Well, they're going to they're gonna shrink him down and make him like a baby? I don't know. Yeah, I don't understand. They're going to they're gonna Photoshop his face on a newborn infant. They're like, look, it's Frodo. And an awkward scene where they show this baby. <laughs> oh, you know what? I just made a major, major error. All those shoot, shooting dates are wrong. Those shooting dates are for the Superman reboot. Well, that certainly does make a lot more sense uh, because I was surprised that I, I didn't even know they're doing it. Ian another. Holm will reappear as the older Bilbo Baggins. Are you? Do you care about a Superman reboot? Yes. Uh, well, yes and no. Um, I'm not excited about it, but do I want it to stay the way it was after the last one? No. They definitely need to reboot it. No, I was very disappointed with the <laughs> yeah. last one. and. Especially because of the betrayal, like like the trailer starting off, the, or the, the opening credits starting off the way the original Superman series did, and the aesthetic of everything. I was very excited, and then it just was creepy. Stalkerazzi Superman did not do it for this guy. Yeah. No. I I thought Superman was okay. We talked about this on Current Geek Weekly, the, the final episode, and Su Superman was okay. Lois Lane was not okay. Uh, Kevin Spacey was sometimes okay, but... Sometimes he just was not right for that. Yeah. Uh, also, Ridley Scott is abandoning the Alien prequel idea. Uh, <sighs> it's just it's just not going to happen. Uh, well, I don't know how I feel about this because on the one hand, we all love Alien. But real quick, quick question, Tom. What was the very best movie in the entire Aliens series? Aliens. That's right. And how much did he have to do with that one? Nothing, nothing. Not, yeah, not so much. Not nearly as much. It was James Cameron's vision of Aliens that was the yeah. best of all. Alien was moody and it was uh, it was great and it, because it was novel and the nature of the creature was good. But it's like, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, we're talking about the guy who did Gladiator, which kind of and takes Dan, it down for me a little bit. Dan O'Bannon is quoted. He was the co-creator of Alien with Ridley Scott. Dan O'Bannon says, I'd like to see it stop. A horror movie's <laughs> a fragile thing, and once you've gotten past the original, it isn't scary anymore, which I think he's yes. wrong about because Aliens was pretty scary, even though it was a sequel. Uh, but it but was a totally different movie. But he says, so you do a bunch of sequels to a horror movie. All they do is drain the remaining impact out of the original. It's not as effective as it would have been if you had just left it alone. And it looks like uh, the Alien prequel is now mutated into an original sci-fi film project called Prometheus. Well, that's always a bad thing. Not as not sci-fi as an S Y F Y, but as an original science fiction project. Okay, sorry, sorry. I take yeah, it yeah, all yeah. Back. No, I realized right. that could be <laughs> misinterpreted. I was like, that is quite a drop from a Ridley Scott. Oh Scott man, movie. yeah, do a sci-fi Friday night original movie. That would be bad news. All right, uh, let's move on to tube tops really quickly. <laughs> All 
Uh, X-Men First Class coming to television, and they've got the first publicity photos out of the 1960s X-Men flashback. This is sort of the Starfleet Academy of X-Men, going back this? to somewhat the original concept of the X-Men under the tutelage of Xavier. This is such a neat idea, but I don't know that I trust them. I, I Weirdly, get this. Tell me if you feel this way. If this, If somebody told me this was a web-only project, I would think it's awesome. If somebody told me it was a movie, I would think it's awesome. But because it's a TV show, I just feel like budgetarily it's just going to get screwed up. It's I, I don't trust it. I don't know. I don't think I don't think this is going to be the Mad Men of X-Men TV shows. Will it be the Smallville of X-Men TV shows? Maybe so. Maybe so. I mean, anything's possible, but it's like uh, I'm, I'm hesitant because of the format, because TV is so squirrely about the amount of output it tries to put out and the amount of money it tries to spend on it. You don't always like I think this would make an amazing three minute YouTube trailer and an amazing two hour movie yeah, TV show. James McAvoy as Professor Charles Xavier also has hair. I, I, I could care less about that. Like all really? those all those little stickler things. No, that, he's got to be bald. Nah, it doesn't bother me as long as as long as because I love the fact that they've looks like they've got the yellow X suits on, which is pretty awesome. I'm down with that. I'm down with that. But again, it's like when when you're doing a TV show, you have major long term concerns, usually continue, usually tied to specific sponsors and what tests well. And those aren't concerns for a vi short viral video or for a long format movie, or not as big of a concern. Uh, and I, I just don't know. I just don't trust it. I, I don't want to see the cheesy 1960s references. Again, love, love, love the idea. I'm more skeptical because it's a TV show. All right, before we get to what we've been watching, uh, there there's some good stuff coming up this week on TV. Uh, Tuesday, uh, No Ordinary Family on ABC. Uh, if you're if you're into No Ordinary Family, not, not everybody. Have you been watching it? Haven't been watching it. Uh, but I am watching V, which is also Tuesday, so we should get a new V tonight. Uh, I, I'm I'm still giving it a hang. It you know I want it. It basically strings me along one after the other. Uh, Sci-fi is doing marathons all week, so you're gonna get the Invaders. You're gonna get uh, uh, Level Nine on Friday. Star Wars: The Clone Wars uh, has another episode out, and also returning is Fringe, which which nine p.m. <laughs> on Friday. I, uh, uh, you know what? People are sending me their fringe discs. The, the fans have spoken, and the great Brian Brushwood fringe experiment shall begin, and I'll be reporting in on that shortly. I would uh, recommend that you record all the fringe episodes starting this Friday, and uh, if you can, just, uh, just go on, turn on the TV, press play, turn off the TV, come back, you know, half hour later and escape. That way it gets you know checked on your dvr recorder as a play oh so uh, like like you are you are so hardcore at this point mm -hmm. you're trying to recruit me just to get them the views to keep this thing alive i definitely think you'll watch it and love it but we this thing is on life support now it's been moved to fridays the fox execs say they really want it to survive but yeah of course they want it to survive because if it survives that means it got good ratings on a friday and that's just never happens all right. Well, then I'll, uh, I'll have to, I will help to make that. I will do my part. I will subscribe to it right now. All right. Uh, finally, what we've been watching, The Cape. Uh, have you? Okay. So so uh, the reason I'm all fried and was almost late for the taping of this. Uh, taping? What is this? 1998? Uh, the, the, the live yeah. shooting of this. Come on. This is a filming. With my, with my crazy schedule, I got home and I was like, I should really take a nap so I'll be on good, good spirits. But so many people, I could not believe how many people messaged in the chat room, sent me emails, hit me up over Twitter saying, you got to watch The Cape. And so I went in and this is one of the most schizophrenic experiences I've had with the pilot. I've only watched the first episode, but I, the first 10 minutes, I loved it because I was like, oh, I get it. It's a cartoon. And the tone is just right to where I don't care for how silly giant aspects of it are. You know, it felt more like Men in Black. It had that ability mm. to just scoop me up into its comic booky universe and I didn't care. And then something would change and I'd be like, well, all of a sudden I do care. And I don't like the way you're being silly about it. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden I didn't care again. And then my, my daughter came in and I was like, wait, no, this will be what saves it. I'll watch it with my six-year-old six and she'll think it's awesome. But it was way too scary for my six-year-old. Oh, so really? I couldn't get into it in that environment. Uh. 
I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it another try in another couple episodes. So, but, did you get to the point uh, where he has put on the cape and he's had his first battle against yes. Chess and yes. and and he's and and the uh, the guy tiny spoiler alert here, but the guy from the circus pretends to die. And then yes. that uh, was the yes, end of yes. what I watched. Did, did you that watch it? That was a, a very, uh, uh, in fact, that was right at the end. And it was very, uh, yeah. that was a very okay. charming moment. Because what I watched it, was a two-hour recording on USA Network, which was a reprise. And I only watched the first hour of it. But I think that's the pilot. And I think the yes. second hour of what I recorded was actually the second episode. So I've right. watched. So we both watched the same thing yeah. then. Yeah. Good. I, I had a very specific reaction to it. I started watching it. Started off a little slow, but I was okay. I'm like, yeah, this is this is a creation story. You got to be a little patient with creation stories, right? This is an origin story. Uh, got into the origin story. I was like, okay, this is going all right. I like I like the the you know the the police chief getting killed, and you know that's setting things up, and then obvious uh, allusions to Afghanistan and private security firms and all that. It's not the first time it's been done, but it was all right. Uh, I loved uh, seeing the guy from the Tudors. Uh, show up as the evil head of the security firm who also has a double life. Uh, and I'm I'm actually enjoying it. I'm like, it's not the best thing I've ever seen, but it's interesting and I'm cool with it until I will give you exactly the point, 38 minutes in. Okay. At 38 minutes in, suddenly everything stopped making sense. And it just seemed like there was an outline that said, now discover CAPE. Now get training. Now execute powers. Now yeah, go it, fight bad guy. Was, and there was nothing connecting one scene to another. Like the whole explanation in the circus where they're like, well, the, you know, the, I thought the cape was going to have been from the cape that's inspired the comic book or that the cape had some kind of like history to it. No, it did, but the history didn't matter. And then all like of a sudden says, that's... And what's funny, what's funny is when he discovers it, it's not even the cape. He discovers like a oh, that old cloth. thing. Yeah. He and essentially he starts doing like an adult version of Star Wars kid. Right, right. Going flinging, flinging cloth around, pretending to be a superhero. And then this guy comes in and discovers him and says, "You got the goods." And, well, and he, he decides and to stuff give just him stops like, making That's sense. not the real cape. He's like, "I haven't seen that thing in years." What are you talking about? It was just hanging up in your office. <laughs> I mean, you have it. Who hung it there then? And it's like, we're going to show, I, I liked the idea of instead of Batman with the gadgets, he's an illusionist, right? But right. I don't believe that's what he's doing. Yeah. It just, no, I agree. It's like, oh, everything I do by flipping out my cape and then my cape magically grabs it. Like, well, and also the, uh, <laughs> in the chat room, Thundercast just shouted, don't worry about spoilers. The show will be canceled soon. Yes. So I, I don't know if that's the case, the case or not, but it's like, I kind of dig the idea of them using illusions and hypnosis to achieve a, a virtual superhuman like status. But, uh, and in fact, I don't know if you know this, but, but the, the guy who runs the circus, his name is Max Malini in the show. Max Malini is a very famous magician. He's one of the most uh, treasured experts on misdirection and sleight of hand. He's the guy who said that the way to do proper misdirection is to look someone in the eye and ask him a meaningful question. And while they're trying to think of an answer, that's when you do your secret moves with your hands. Oh, and they use that. Yeah. So there, there are neat illusions in here, and I like the idea that it's going. But um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna watch all the first three episodes that are up on Hulu. Uh, the chat room shouting at me right now that you got to give it all the way through, and maybe I will. But right now, it's just too schizophrenic for me. If it was all the way silly or if it was all the way serious, I think I could go either way. But right now, it's a little too much of half and half. It's like, oh, it's serious until a midget beats up a full-grown man. And then, oh, it's silly until some adult gets murdered in cold blood. You yeah. know, and it's like I can't, I can't have it both ways. Yeah, I, I, I know what they mean. It may be that they had to skimp on the pilot and rushed that, that, that ending because they realized they had an hour and a half movie and they only had 45 minutes, you know, 40 minutes to fill. And that's why those scenes are so unconnected and things just seem unexplained and the motivations don't seem real. And like all of a sudden he, he like he jumps in the car with Summer Glau and drives home and then he goes, who are you? Like you didn't, <laughs> didn't talk about that on the way over. Maybe I mean I I don't know. It's just I'll tell you what though. Strangely, that's the one part that really wants me to like it and really wants me to make the show work. Is Summer Glau deserves a hit. She is so unfathomably 
talented. She's so good. And uh, and again, I've only watched the first episode, but uh, in 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 Serenity, you got to see a, an amazing range of reactions and 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 acting from her. Same thing with uh, Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles. I've not seen that. She's just some chick in this show, and I'm hoping that I do get to see that they take advantage of her of her talents because she's super good. She's the real deal. Yeah, I have liked everything Summer Glau has done, even uh, the the stu- the guest appearances on dollhouse uh i thought yes. thought were fantastic uh so yeah i'm hoping they make more of her and and i've seen that happens with with shows that i've liked where the pilot has just let you down and you got you do have to give it a couple episodes for it to get going so yeah i i've still got the other three now the other two since i've read the first one to look at and uh, all right i'm convinced i'll look at them uh let's finish up with an email to frame rate show at gmail.com and michael writes first off this show is fantastic and is proving to be the ED medication to the collective internet nerdgasm. I'm very Oof. hesitant to accept that compliment. Yes, I am me not too. entirely sure what that means. My, but I, I understand that you like the show and I'm, we're happy to put it out for you. How about that? Regarding the George Lucas impenetrable wall of suck or the Duke Nukem Forever syndrome, I will point you to, as far as I'm concerned, the best song the White Stripes ever wrote. It is called Little Room and is less than a minute long, and the lyrics are thus. Well, in your little room, and you're working on something good, but if it's really good, you're going to need a bigger room. And when you're in the bigger room, you might not know what to do. You might have to think of how you got started in your little room. Not to get too poetic, but I think that actually describes Lucas. This idea permeates any and all creative fields in such a profound way. It's staggering that Jack White was able to tap so succinctly into such a strange and universal truth. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. Beautiful, man. if you want to blow our minds with an with, uh, an allusion to some poetry, hit us up at frameratesshow at gmail dot com, uh, where I promise that I will actually read all of those like I normally do, not like this week. This was a busy week. Thanks, everybody. That's it for this edition of Frame Rate. We'll see you next week. Frame rate.